All right, without further ado, if you'd like to open up your Bibles, we're going to start off in Isaiah chapter 26 this morning. Isaiah chapter 26. And uh, again, good morning to everyone who is watching at home online. We know there are many who are tuned in live uh, watching this service uh, at home as well. Isaiah chapter 26. And we're going to start in verse 19. And the title of this morning's Easter Sunday message is, Your Dead Shall Live, looking at the doctrine of the resurrection from the dead. Isaiah 26, 19. Your dead shall live, together with my dead body, they shall arise. Awake and sing, you who dwell in the dust, for your dew is like the dew of herbs, and the earth shall cast out the dead. This is uh, an Old Testament reference to the resurrection from the dead. The resurrection of Jesus Christ, of course, is the cornerstone of the Christian faith. If, If Jesus was not raised from the dead... I'm telling you right now, nobody would know his name. He would have been lost. Jesus Christ's name would have been lost to history and the annals of history, except for the fact that he said he was going to be taken. He said he was going to be killed. He said that he was going to be buried. And he said that he was going to be raised from the dead on the third day. And he was, and he is alive forevermore. And this is why uh, we are here this morning. This is why the church uh, exists and is celebrating his resurrection all over the world, all over the world today, nearly 2,000 years later. Uh, it, it is an incredible, incredible uh, miracle, and, and it is something that we should always be uh, excited about, that Jesus is alive. I've been to Jerusalem, the uh, whole Church of the Holy Sepulchre, where they believe that his body was, is empty. There's no body there, and Uh, at the garden tomb where there's another alternative spot for uh, perhaps where Jesus was buried um, in in the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea is empty. There is uh, no grave for Jesus. There is no corpse. There is no body because he is alive. He's resurrected. His body is alive and seated at the right hand of the Father uh, even now. And so as we are here this morning, we are going to take a look at the doctrine of the resurrection. We're going to start in the Old Testament and make our way into the New Testament. This is certainly not an exhaustive study, uh, but this will give you a fairly thorough understanding of the doctrine of the resurrection. It was not just a New Testament doctrine. It wasn't just a Christian doctrine, actually. Uh, This uh, uh, finds its roots in Judaism and in the Old Testament. Now, we know that Jesus Christ is the first fruits from the dead, indicating that there are going to be many, many more, a multitude who are also going to be raised from the dead. And even as Jesus has this this perfect uh, uh, body that he now uh, uh, abides in, as it were, that he now has in heaven, uh, for us too, we have this promise that we are no longer going to be uh, in this limited body, this, this fallen body that gets tired, that gets hungry, uh, that gets thirsty, that gets, that gets weary, that gets cranky, uh, that's uh, subject to all of the exhaustion and all of the, the cares and the burdens of this life. We are going to have a body We're told exactly like the resurrected body of Jesus Christ. And this is something that we should be uh, excited about, something that we can look forward to as we uh, go through this life and we age and we get older and we get more tired and the body literally begins to fall apart. We uh, know that this is not the body that we're going to live in forever. We are going to have a resurrected body just like the body of Jesus Christ. He is the first fruits from the dead. uh, And then uh, we will also uh, be with him in our resurrected bodies forever and ever. And we're going to be as mankind was meant to be. We're going to be perfect. We're going to be sinless. And we will be eternal also at that point. Right now, these bodies are temporal and they're falling apart. And the longer you live, the older you get, the more you realize. And you're probably thankful that you don't have to live in this body forever because the the body just wears out. Uh, But this is not our permanent habitation. This body uh, is not our permanent home. We look forward to uh, that resurrected body that we will get when Christ comes back for us. Now, there are numerous examples, of course, in the scriptures of people that are raised from the dead, but 
the, uh, all of the other resurrections in the Bible, both Old and New Testament, uh, those bodies were still subject to death. They weren't glorified resurrected bodies. For example, Lazarus. Lazarus was raised from the dead uh, after he was in the tomb for four days, but Lazarus went on to die again. Everybody that was raised from the dead, uh, except for, of course, Jesus' resurrected body, they all were still subject to death. They didn't have their glorified resurrected bodies. That is something for the future. And here we see in Isaiah chapter 26 and verse 19, the prophet Isaiah, uh, who uh, had so much that God had, had shown to him about Jesus and about the future, uh, Isaiah was, was basically saying, we are all going to be resurrected. Your dead shall live together, Isaiah says, with my dead body, they shall arise. So Isaiah was expecting that he was going to be raised from the dead. This is an Old Testament doctrine uh, as well as uh, New Testament, of course. Awake and sing, you who dwell in the dust, for your dew is like the dew of herbs, and the earth shall cast out their dead. So uh, I want to just jump to a couple of scriptures here in the Old Testament before we move into the New Testament and we look at the resurrection of the dead of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ this Easter Sunday morning. Job chapter 19. Remember Job was the one who was suffering so terribly and, uh, and, and Satan was just out to, to just destroy him and he didn't understand why and he didn't know what was going on and... and, and uh, he had the faith, though, to look forward into the future and to know that, that this life was not all that there was, that there was going to be a resurrection from the dead, even uh, for Job. We read in Job chapter 19 and verse 25, For I know that my Redeemer lives, and he shall stand at last on the earth. And after my skin is destroyed, this I know, that in my flesh... I shall see God, whom I shall see for myself, and my eyes shall behold, and not another, how my heart yearns within me. And incredibly, if you've ever read the book of Job, it, it really is a, a, a sad uh, book all the way up until the end when God restores everything that he lost, and God restores it double uh, what he lost. But most of Job's uh, um, uh, writings are, are his complaint and his crying out because he didn't understand. Matter of fact, Job uh, often said, it would have been better if I had never been born. Uh, why don't you just let me die? Why do you let me linger on? Because Job didn't understand really what was going on. But in the midst of that pain, in the midst of all of the loss that Job had suffered, and he suffered loss of pretty much everything that he loved, and finally even his own health uh, was destroyed, he says, but I know that my Redeemer lives he shall stand at last on the earth, and after my skin is destroyed, this I know that in my flesh I shall, I shall see God. Now, how could he see God if his flesh is, he's talking about death, he's talking about dying and going to the, to the grave. Uh, he knew, God showed him that there would be a resurrection from the dead, and that the Old Testament saints, the righteous from the Old Testament, uh, will also have resurrected bodies. In Psalm Chapter 16 and verse 10, we read this, a messianic prophecy about our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and his resurrection, Psalm of David. David says, for you will not leave my soul in Sheol or in the place of the dead, nor will you allow your holy one or your anointed one to see Corruption, And we know that this is a prophecy concerning Jesus Christ because David is buried and his tomb is still there in Jerusalem. As a matter of fact, in Jerusalem, underneath the city of Jerusalem, it's one of the holiest sites for the Jews, is the sepulcher of King David. And they have a 24-hour, uh, uh, um, 365 day a year. They have people there, rabbis and religious men, praying there quietly at the tomb of King David, believing that he is going to be resurrected from the dead and believing that he's going to be their Messiah and so forth. Uh, of course, their theology is a little bit off there, but the reality is David is buried. David will one day be raised from the dead. This is not speaking of David. This is speaking of Jesus Christ. We know this because it's quoted for us uh, in the book of Acts. And so this is prophetically Jesus speaking for you, God the Father, will not leave my soul in Sheol, nor will you allow your Holy One, speaking of Jesus Christ, to see corruption. 
We see again in Psalms, in Psalm chapter 49 and verse 15, another scripture about the resurrection from the dead. But God, Psalm 49, 15, will redeem my soul from the power of the grave, for he shall receive me. So uh, this is not just a New Testament Christian doctrine of the resurrection from the dead. This is something that the Jews and Judaism uh, taught and God had revealed to uh, the prophets and to some of the Old Testament saints. In Hosea chapter 13 and verse 14, we read this, I will ransom them from the power of the grave. Hosea 13, 14, I will redeem them from death. O death, I will be your plagues, O grave, I will be your destruction. Pity is hidden from my eyes. God speaking here who has the power over death and the power over the grave. God is saying, I will ransom them. Who? The Old Testament saints, the New Testament saints, all of God's people on that day. I will ransom them from the power of the grave. I will redeem them from death. Ransom means bought and purchased. Redeemed means to be set free from from the bondage of slavery. And we know that Jesus ransomed us. He paid the price for our sins and he redeemed us back to God. And then we read in Daniel. If you want to turn to Daniel chapter 12, this is probably one of the most well-known Old Testament scriptures that teach about the resurrection from the dead. Daniel chapter 12 and verse 1. And this is speaking of the time of the great tribulation period, the time of the 70th week of Daniel, the time of Jacob's trouble. Daniel chapter 12 and verse 1 says this, At that time, Michael shall stand up, this is Michael the archangel, the great prince who stands watch over the sons of your people, over Israel, and there shall be a time of trouble, such as never was since there was a nation, even to that time. And at that time, your people shall be delivered, everyone who is found written in the book, the book of life. Verse 2, And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. And those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the firmament, and those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. So God shows Daniel something that we didn't learn earlier in the Psalms or in Job. And this is that it's not just going to be a resurrection uh, of the righteous. There is also going to be a resurrection of the unrighteous. This is not just a resurrection of the saved. Uh, Old Testament saints, New Testament saints. This is also a resurrection of the unsaved. And it's very important that we understand that this is something that was taught in the Old Testament as well as the New Testament. And actually the New Testament, of course, is the greatest commentary uh, there is on the Old Testament. And then God told Daniel in verse 13, But you go your way till the end, for you shall rest and will arise to your inheritance at the end of days. So God was even showing Daniel that he was going to be resurrected from the dead at the end uh, of the tribulation period. We know that we have the prophecy of the dry bones. We've looked at that uh, uh, in some detail when we were looking at the war of Gog and Magog and the restoration of the nation of Israel, the dry bones, bones prophecy in Ezekiel 37. And we know that Ezekiel 37 is speaking about the resurrection of the nation of Israel, reborn on May 14th, 1948, uh, and, and that God is going to redeem and restore and God is going to save Israel at his second coming. But we read this interestingly, uh, this description of, of the resurrection from the the dead in Ezekiel chapter 37 of the nation of Israel. Verse 11 says this, then he said to me, son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. They indeed say our bones are dry. Our hope is lost and we ourselves are cut off. Uh, Ezekiel 37, 12, therefore prophesy and say to them, thus says the Lord God, behold, O my people, I will open your graves and cause you to come up, up, up out of your graves and bring you into the land of Israel. Then you shall know that I am the Lord when I have opened your graves, O my people, and brought you up from your graves. 
I will put my spirit in you and you shall live and I will place you in your own land. Then you shall know that I, the Lord, have spoken it and performed it, says the Lord. So we know that this is spiritually speaking about the resurrection of the nation. But I believe this is also a literal reference to the literal physical resurrection of the Jews from the dead. The Old Testament saints are going to be raised. As a matter of fact, uh, Jewish people, especially Orthodox Jewish people, they want to be buried in Jerusalem. They want to be right there. So they don't have to go a long ways to get there to Jerusalem at the resurrection. It's uh, some of the most uh, prized real estate on the planet is the cemeteries there in Jerusalem for the Orthodox Jews because they believe that they are going to be resurrected from the dead. Those who understand uh, these teachings. So let's go to the New Testament where we see that Jesus had quite a bit to say about this before his death, his burial, and his resurrection. Turn with me to John chapter 5, if you would, where Jesus begins to talk about this resurrection from the dead. Not just for, again, the righteous, but also for the unrighteous. The reality is, is we're all going to live forever somewhere. John chapter 5 and verse 21, our Lord Jesus tells us this. For as the Father raises the dead and gives life to them, even so the Son gives life to whom he will. So speaking of the Father raising the dead, resurrected from the grave. Skip to verse 25 of John chapter 5. Most assuredly I say to you, the hour is coming and now is, when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God, and those who hear will live. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son to have life in himself and has given him authority to execute judgment also because he is the Son of Man. Do not marvel at this, verse 28, for the hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear his voice and come forth. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. So even as Daniel recorded for us under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, that it's going to be the righteous and the unrighteous will both be raised from the dead on the last day. So Jesus Christ, God incarnate, uh, who cannot lie, of course, is telling us what's coming. He's telling us the future. He's telling us that there is going to be a resurrection. Those who have done good, to the resurrection of life, and those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. In John chapter 6 and verse 39, Jesus tells us this, This is the will of the Father who has sent me, that of all he has given me I should lose nothing, but should raise it up at the last day. And this is the will of him who sent me, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him may have everlasting life. And notice, and I will raise him up on the last day. And so Jesus is telling us there's going to be a resurrection from the dead. Whether you believe it or not, whether you want to believe it or not, whether you hope that you just cease to exist when you die that's not what the scriptures say is going to happen number one your soul is eternal your soul uh, will always live somewhere forever and ever your soul or your spirit uh, if you're a christian you don't have anything to fear the bible says to be absent from the body is to be present with the lord so when we die our soul goes to be with jesus our body goes back to the earth and to the dust awaiting the resurrection from the dead for the believers for the unbelievers they go to a place called hell. They go to a place called Hades where they are in torment and they are awaiting the final judgment. We're told that hell or Hades is in the center of the earth and that's where the unrighteous dead will go, their spirits, until the time of the general resurrection of all of the dead at the end of the millennial reign of Christ and then the great white throne judgment. And then that's when all of the unbelievers will also get their bodies. We're going to look at when the believers will get their resurrected bodies. We get our res resurrected bodies first. At the end of the thousand year reign of Christ, all of the dead will be raised. They will all stand before the, the throne of God, the great white throne judgment of God, we're told in Revelation chapter 20. And for those whose names are not written in the Lamb's book of life, they will be cast alive forever and ever in their resurrected bodies uh, into the eternal lake of fire following uh, Satan and the Antichrist and the false prophet and all of those who took the mark of the beast during the great tribulation period, etc. Jesus tells us back in Matthew chapter 16 
and verse 21 that he was going to die, but he was not going to stay dead. Uh, Matthew chapter 16, verse 21. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and the chief priests and the scribes, and that he would be killed, but he would be raised on the third day. And so Jesus was telling his disciples to expect it. You know that they all fled. They all uh, were, were terrified that they were going to be arrested next. And he was left alone. We read about this on Good Friday. We uh, looked at how he was abandoned and forsaken uh, by even all of his followers. And, and then, uh, incredibly, three days after he was taken and he was killed and he was crucified and he was buried... He began to appear to them. He began to appear alive to them. And it just transformed these men to where they became empowered by the Holy Spirit to go and preach the gospel. Again, if Jesus was not resurrected from the dead, you and I today would not know his name. He would have been lost to history. But because he was resurrected from the dead, and he's the only one who's been resurrected from the dead and has gone on in his resurrected body, uh, we know that Jesus Christ is alive forevermore and that this message of the gospel is the truth. In John chapter 20, as we look at uh, when Jesus first appeared to his disciples after he was raised, this is on Easter Sunday, the first Easter Sunday morning. John chapter 20 and verse 9 says this, after he was raised from the dead, they, they, were, they were hesitant to believe. They, they, they were uh, obviously skeptical that, that what was being reported was true, that Jesus was alive. Because they all saw him die. They all knew that he was dead, that he was buried. But it says, for as yet they did not know the scripture that he must rise again from the dead. Even to them, they didn't get the memo. They didn't get the message. Jesus was trying to prepare them and warn them, but they all fell away as was prophesied to happen when he was taken and he was brutally killed and murdered and crucified uh, for your sins and mine on the cross of Calvary. Skip to verse 19. John 20, 19. Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, so we know that this is Easter Sunday, the first uh, uh, Sunday when Jesus was raised from the dead, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in their midst, and he said to them, Peace be with you. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. So Jesus said to them again, Peace to you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. So notice this, that they were still scared. They were still in hiding. They thought that they were going to be arrested next and that they would be taken and crucified, uh, perhaps, or killed. And Jesus appears to them. He doesn't just appear to them. He literally walks through the walls and he comes in uh, into their presence as they're gathered together in this upper room. He walks through the walls because it says the doors were shut where the disciples were, were assembled for fear of the Jews. No doubt they had that door shut, bolted, locked and chained and all the rest. And Jesus just appears in their midst. He has a physical body, but he has a physical body that's different from the body that he had had before for his 33 years here on the earth. He now is able to walk through the walls. And this is how uh, our resurrected body is going to be as well. Skip to verse 24. Now Thomas, called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. Thomas was apparently somewhere else when Jesus had appeared to them in the upper room there. The other disciples therefore said to him, we have seen the Lord. So he said to them, unless I see his hands, unless I see in his hands the print of the nails, and I put my finger into the a print, uh, and I put my finger into the print of the nails, and I put my hand into his side, 
I will not believe. This is why Thomas now uh, is uh, considered and called doubting Thomas, poor guy. But, you know, he was probably no different than you and I would have been in the same situation. He was skeptical. But he's saying, look, unless I can, I, I believe you guys. I, I, I don't think you're lying to me. But he says, unless I could physically touch Jesus Christ, if I could physically see that it's his body and see the, the holes that are in his hands and, and the hole that is in his side uh, from where they stuck the spear up into his side when he was hanging on the cross, he says, I will not believe. It says, verse 26, and after eight days, his disciples were again inside and Thomas with them. And Jesus came, the doors being shut, and he stood in the midst and he said, peace to you, shalom. Then he said to Thomas, reach your finger here and look at my hands and reach your hand here and put it into my side. Do not be unbelieving, but believing. And Thomas answered and said to him, my Lord, and my God, and Jesus said to him, Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. But blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. So what do we learn from this? We learn that Jesus' body is not just a spiritual body. It is a physical body. It's not just a spirit. It's a physical body. It's a tangible physical body, although a glorified resurrected body that defies our laws of nature and our laws of science, that he could appear instantly uh, and disappear instantly and appear somewhere else, that he could walk through walls so he's no longer bound uh, by the space-time continuum that we're all bound by. And this is exciting for us because we're told we're going to get a body just like this, when the resurrection happens from the dead and the rapture of the church, etc. But Jesus tells Thomas this. He, he doesn't uh, uh, criticize Thomas or he doesn't put Thomas down. But he says, Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. But blessed are all those who have not seen and yet have believed. And you know what, guys? That's you and I this morning. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ and you've trusted Jesus uh, as your Savior and you've been born again, you are believing in the resurrected Christ. I'm believing in the resurrected Christ. And for 2,000 years of history, there's Christians all over the world that have believed in the resurrected Christ, although we have never seen him physically, and yet we believe. And so Jesus says, blessed are those who have not seen, and yet they believe. And that is you and I in the church today uh, on Easter Sunday, 2022. Turn to the book of Acts. We read in the book of Acts, uh, and, and they're preaching uh, the gospel and Peter is filled with the Holy Spirit and, and, and talking about how Jesus was alive, how he wasn't, he's no longer dead. He's seen him. They've interacted with him. Jesus has been ascended at this point to the Father and Jesus has promised he's going to come again uh, to receive us to himself that where he is we may be also. And we read this in Acts chapter 2. In verse 27, Peter is quoting from that Old Testament psalm that we read earlier in Psalm chapter 16. Verse 27 of Acts chapter 2 says this, For you will not leave my soul in Hades, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. You have made known to me the ways of life. You will make me full of joy in your presence. And then Peter says this, Men and brethren, let me speak freely to you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. And incredibly, his tomb is still there in Jerusalem 2,000 years after Peter said this. So David was not speaking of himself when David said that he was going to be raised from the dead. He was speaking prophetically of the Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, being a prophet, verse 30, and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his own body, according to the flesh, he would raise up the Messiah to sit on his throne. He, foreseeing this, spoke concerning the resurrection of the Christ or the Messiah, that his soul was not left in Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. Verse 32, this Jesus God has raised up of which we are all witnesses. So uh, the fulfillment of the prophecy of the Old Testament that Jesus Christ is not dead, he is alive forevermore. And that's the gospel of the message. It hasn't changed in 2,000 years. Now, we are told also in the book of 1 Corinthians, 
that we will also have a resurrected body. And this is where the doctrine of the rapture of the church and the resurrection of the saints for the New Testament believers, this is some of the uh, instruction in the New Testament epistles about what that's going to be like and what that's going to look like. We read in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 3, Paul the Apostle says this, For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures, that he was seen by Cephas, that is Peter, and by the twelve. After that, he was seen by over 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part of them remain to present, but some have fallen asleep or have died. After that, he was seen by James, then by all the apostles. Then last of all, he was seen by me also as by one born out of due time. So Paul is telling them, you could go and ask. There's still people living at this time who have seen the resurrected Christ. If you're doubtful of this doctrine and if you're not sure about it, Paul is saying, look, I've seen the resurrected Christ. Uh, Peter saw the resurrected Christ. Uh, The disciples saw him. The apostles saw him. 500 at one time saw him. And even some of them doubted, we're told, when it was recorded that he appeared to this great multitude in Matthew's gospel. It says they saw him, but some doubted. They they thought their eyes were playing tricks on them. But he's saying this is not a, a secret doctrine. This is not something where we're telling you that Jesus just appeared to us privately and secretly and you have to take our word for it. He's saying that you can go ask the people around. There's people who will testify to this that Jesus Christ was dead, he was buried, and he is alive now forevermore. And one more thing I want to mention. I I quote a lot of scripture because, quite frankly, uh, my words are not nearly uh, uh, as important as God's word. And so my, my job is to just get the word of God out to you because it's God's word that pierces our heart, that really transforms us. But Uh, The Old Testament was written by numerous people over a very long period of time. The Old Testament, the New Testament, was written by numerous people over a long period of time. It's been estimated that the Bible was written over a 14 or 1500 year period of time by over 40 different authors in three different languages. And yet, so the Bible is not just a book. It is a collection of books that the author of the Bible Uh, of course, was the men who wrote this, like Paul the Apostle wrote this for us, John wrote John's Gospel, etc. Daniel wrote the book of Daniel, but it was under the inspiration and the power of the Holy Spirit that they wrote the Scriptures, and that's why everything just comes together so perfectly. My goodness, you couldn't even get two people to agree on anything, three people to agree on anything if you're taking something that was written a thousand years earlier, 1,500 years earlier, and yet we see uh, that the Bible has one voice, it has one message, Uh, the Bible does not contradict itself, Uh, It is a collection of inspired books where these men of God were moved by the Holy Spirit. The things that they wrote were exactly what God wanted them to write. They were preserved and they were kept for us to this day. And so it's it's a really incredible thing as you read through the scriptures. uh, There is no contradiction in the Bible. If you think there's a contradiction, you just uh, haven't dug deep enough or looked hard enough to find uh, the answers. Because God is the author from Genesis to Revelation and it's all about Jesus Christ. We read in verse 16 of 1 Corinthians chapter 15, skipping ahead. Paul says this about the resurrection of the dead, because there were many who were not believing in the resurrection from the dead. For if the dead do not rise, he said, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Then also those who have fallen asleep or have died in Christ have perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men the most pitiable or the most to be pitied. In other words, if Jesus wasn't raised from the dead, then really uh, there, there is no Christian faith. I mean, the Christian faith, the cornerstone, the foundation of the Christian faith is this, that Jesus paid the price for our sins on the cross of, cross of Calvary. He took our sins, he took the punishment for our sins upon the cross, and then he conquered death by being raised on the third day because he didn't have any sins of his own. The wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. All of us deserve to die because we're sinners. Every man who's ever lived, including Adam and Eve, they're all sinners. We all deserve death. 
Jesus had no sin. He did not deserve to die. He was a substitute. He was our propitiation. He took our place. He took our sins. God made him who knew no sin to become sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. 2 Corinthians 5.21 tells us. And so... Jesus is alive. Death could not keep Jesus down. And Jesus paid the price for our sins and not for our sins only, 1 John 2, 2 says, but for the sins of the whole world, for all who will trust on his name. And if Jesus is not resurrected from the dead, Paul says, you know, we are the most to be pitied, but he is resurrected from the dead. He'll go on to say, verse 20 of 1 Corinthians 15 but now, he says, Christ is risen from the dead, has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. And fallen asleep is an allegory for death because when people die, it you know, kind of looks like they're sleeping when they're laying there uh, in the casket. And, and, and it is a sleeping, as it were, of the body until the resurrection. The spirit, of course, goes to be with the Lord. He says, for since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. Verse 22, for as in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive, but each one in his own order. Christ, the firstfruits, afterward those who are Christ at his coming. Then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father and he puts an end to all rule and authority and power for he must reign till he has put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that will be destroyed is death. And so there is a resurrection of the dead for the believers at his coming and then after that for all people who have ever lived. Skip to verse 42. He's talking about what the resurrection of the dead is like. He says, so also is the resurrection of the dead. The body is sown in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor, it is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, it is raised in power. It is sown a natural body, it is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body and there also is a spiritual body. And he was giving them the example of a seed that what you plant in the earth when you plant a seed is not what it's going to become. He says you plant a seed in the ground and then it grows into a shoot and then it grows into a tree. Let's say that you plant an orange seed. That orange seed has nothing really, doesn't look anything like the tree that it's going to produce. It has nothing uh, similar to the tree that it's going to produce. Maybe at a DNA genetic level it does. But, you know, you look at a couple of little seeds from your orange and, and incredibly, those little seeds have the power to recreate and resurrect, as it were, an entire tree filled with oranges on it. So he's saying it, it's like that. The resurrection of the dead is like a seed that's planted in the ground. This body is natural. This body is fallen. This body is corruptible. This body is nothing and it's going to go back to the dust. But he says, but the resurrected body is glorious. Uh, it's supernatural. It's spiritual. And even as the seed that is planted really has no bearing on the, the tree that's going to grow and the fruit that's going to grow from that tree, so too our bodies, when they're resurrected from the dead, are going to have so little to, to do with what we look like and feel like and the limitations uh, that we possess uh, now in this fallen body, living in this fallen world. Death is not the end. He says in verse 47, The first man was of the earth, made of dust, ashes to ashes and dust to, to dust. From dust you came to dust you shall return is the curse upon man. He says the second man is the Lord from heaven. As was the man of dust, so are also those who are made of dust. And as is the heavenly man, so also are those who are heavenly. And as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly man. He's the first fruits, indicating there's going to be more to come. We are going to have a resurrected body just like Christ. Verse 50 of 1 Corinthians 15. Now I say this, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does corruption inherit incorruption. So nobody can get to heaven in this body. This body can't make it into heaven. This body must die before we are resurrected and we have our resurrected bodies. He says, behold, I tell you a mystery, verse 51, we shall not all sleep or all die, but we shall all be changed in a moment. In the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption. This mortal 
must put on immortality. So when this corruptible has put on incorruption, this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass that saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your sting? O hell, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. So this is a very specific detailed teaching and prophecy about the resurrection of the dead for the believers. Now, he's speaking here of the second coming of Christ. He's speaking here of the rapture of the church. As a matter of fact, we read in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 13 about Christ's second coming. He says, But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep or those who have died lest you sorrow as those who have no hope. Look, those who have died in Christ, they are with Jesus and we are going to see them again. And so we have the hope. It's sad when we lose our loved ones. Indeed, it is very sad. And I'm a pastor. I experience a tremendous amount uh, of death very personally uh, because uh, I, I'm, I'm often called when someone dies or when they're dying. And, and, and the good news is, is that we mourn when we lose our loved ones, but we do not mourn as those who have no hope. We know that we are going to see our loved ones again. He says, for if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus, those who have already died in the Lord. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Don't have time to go into it, but this is teaching a pre-tribulation rapture. He wouldn't be able to say comfort one another with these words if we had to survive till the end of the tribulation period when uh, seven-eighths of the world's population is going to be exterminated by the Antichrist and wiped out by all of the natural disasters and the calamities coming upon the earth. The resurrection of the dead, the rapture of the church is going to take place prior to the tribulation period. The Lord is going to come. He is going to bring the souls of those who have died in Christ with him. Remember, to be absent from the bodies, to be present with the Lord. Their spirits are with the Lord. Their bodies are in the in the dust. Jesus is going to bring their spirits back to the earth with him. They are going to get their resurrected bodies first. If you look at the old churches back east, Uh, and you look at the old cathedrals in Europe, you often will see that, they number one, they buried their dead right there on the church property, but number two, they were all facing toward Jerusalem, uh, believing that when Jesus Christ came back, that he's going to come for them and that they are going to be raised from the dead and they're going to be taken to be with the Lord forever. And and then we who are alive and remain. So first it's going to be those who have died in Christ, Peter and James and John and Paul and All of the saints who have died before us, their spirits are going to come back with Jesus at the rapture. They're going to get their resurrected bodies first. And then those who are alive and remain, this is the rapture, are going to be resurrected instantaneously. And we will also, if we are alive at this time or another generation of, uh, of Christians are alive at this time, may not be us. Uh, no man knows the day or the hour. We always should be looking for the rapture, the return of Christ for his church. Then we will also get our resurrected bodies. Uh, We read in Philippians, in Philippians chapter 3, Paul the apostle says this about our resurrection from the dead. He says in verse 20, for our citizenship is in heaven from which we also earnestly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body that it may be conformed to his glorious body according to the working by which he is able even to subdue all things to himself. So Paul's saying we're going to get a body just like Christ. The body, he was able to eat fish. He was able to sit with his disciples there on the Sea of Galilee after he was resurrected and, uh, and eat. And he was able to have a physical body that you could handle, you could touch and feel. It wasn't a spirit. He's not a ghost. He had a physical body. He could walk through walls. He could appear instantly and, uh, and disappear and appear somewhere else. 
And his body is, is suited for heaven and not just for heaven, but can also come back to the earth. Because remember, Jesus is going to rule and reign in his resurrected body for a thousand years. And you and I, the church, will rule and reign with him. And we are going to have a glorious body just like his resurrected body. He says in Philippians 3 verse 7, he says, But what things were gained to me, these I have counted lost for Christ. Yet indeed I also count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and I count them as rubbish, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the keeping of the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death, if by any means I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Paul was looking forward to the life that was to come. He was looking for his glorious, glorified body, like the body of Jesus Christ. He wasn't worried about the problems of this world. He wasn't worried about the fact that he was beaten, that he was tortured, that he was imprisoned, that he was chased out of every city that he went to to preach the gospel because he was looking forward to the future body, the future glory that he was going to have with our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So just to give you a recap, the order of the resurrection from the dead goes like this. Jesus, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, is the first fruits from the dead. He's the first one to have this resurrected body. The second uh, order of resurrection would be the dead in Christ. Those who come back with Christ, we read in First uh, Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13 to 18, they're going to get their resurrected bodies first. Third, we who are alive and remain, Paul thought that it could happen in his lifetime. Of course, it was almost 2,000 years ago. It didn't happen in his lifetime. Thank God or you and I wouldn't be alive and we wouldn't be born to be here today to be part of the church. Uh, but then it's going to be we who are alive and remain. So this is the believers who are alive at the second coming of Christ at the rapture of the church. That's third. Fourth, it's going to be the group of people called the tribulation saints. And the tribulation saints are all those who are not part of the church age. Uh, they are those who die because they refuse to take the mark of the beast, the 666 on the right hand of their forehead. They refuse to worship the Antichrist, and then they are killed. They are, uh, the Bible says that they are beheaded for their faith. These are the tribulation saints. We're told in Revelation, in chapter 20, that when Christ comes back at the end of the tribulation period, he comes for us, the church, uh, prior to the tribulation period. But at the end of the seven-year tribulation period, when he comes back, he takes the Antichrist, he throws him into the lake of fire. He takes the false prophet, throws him into the lake of fire. Satan is bound in the abyss for a thousand years. And Jesus then comes into his kingdom, his thousand-year reign, and then forever and ever. But we read this in Revelation chapter 20 and verse 4. And I saw thrones, and they sat on them, and judgment was committed to them. Then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God, who had not worshipped the beast, this is the Antichrist, or his image, and had not received his mark on their foreheads or on their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. So this is not the church. This is a different group of people. The church is the bride of Christ. The church is going to be raptured seven years prior to this event taking place. We're going to be in heaven for the Bema seat of Christ receiving our rewards while the tribulation is taking place on the earth. And we will be preparing uh, for the marriage supper of the Lamb where the bride of Christ, the church, will be married to and united to Christ as the bridegroom for all eternity. So these are those who were killed because they refused to worship the beast or take his mark during the tribulation period. And we're told that this is such a big number. I'm sure there's a lot of people uh, who uh, are, are going to be left behind. A lot of people who aren't living for Jesus. A lot of people aren't thinking about Jesus. They don't care anything about Jesus Christ or the word of God. They're going to be left behind, but they're, they know enough not to take the mark of the beast. They're going to understand this is Satan's man. He's empowered by the dragon, by the devil, and they're going to remember these sermons. and They're going to remember all of the teachings that you gave them, uh, uh, your loved ones that are not believers, and they are going to refuse to take the mark of the beast, and it is going to be their life that will be required. But that's not the end for them. They also are going to receive their resurrected bodies. They are going to live and reign with Christ for a thousand years too. They're going to rule and reign with Christ as well as the church, although they will have a different position. They will not be the bride of Christ as the church is. 
Verse 5 says, But the rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection. Over such the second death has no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. So the, uh, the, there is one more group of people that are resurrected at this time. We don't know exactly when. This, is, of course, is the Old Testament saints. Again, in Daniel chapter uh, 12, verses 1 to 3, Daniel chapter 12, verse 13, we read it earlier. Uh, it, there is going to be a general resurrection of the dead of the righteous Old Testament saints. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, all of the old Esther and Daniel and all of the Old Testament saints who were looking forward to the Messiah. They are going to be resurrected at this time. Perhaps it will be simultaneous that the resurrection of the tribulation saints will take place simultaneously with the Old Testament saints. And all of this is called the first resurrection and blessed are those who have a part in the first resurrection because we don't have to fear the second death now there will be a second resurrection and that will be unto judgment and unto eternal fire we read continuing in revelation chapter 20 then i saw verse 11 a great white throne and him who sat on it from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, the small and the great, standing before God, and the books were open, and another book was open, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works, and by the things which were written in the books. Verse 13, the sea gave up the dead who were in it. Death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them, and they were judged each one according to his works. Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. And that's how it all ends, guys, until we go on to whatever God has for us next. It's really not recorded for us except for the new Jerusalem, the new heavens, and the new earth. We don't really know exactly what we're going to be doing for all eternity, but it's going to be a lot better than whatever's happening here in this world because this world is under the power of Satan. This world is blinded uh, by the devil who's blinded the minds of the unbelievers. This world is corrupted. This world is under the curse of sin and death. And yet God is going to burn it all up with fire and, and he's going to create a new heavens and a new earth wherein righteousness dwells. And so we want to be part of that first resurrection group, right? We don't want to be part of the second resurrection group. Jesus warned about it, the resurrection unto judgment. Daniel warned about it, the resurrection of the unrighteous or of the wicked. And here, uh, John, the beloved apostle, God showing him the future, sees that there's going to be all of these who are raised from the dead, the small and the great, the rich and the poor, all of them, all of the unbelievers, those who were not the Old Testament saints or the New Testament saints or the tribulation saints, those uh, who believe on Jesus Christ. It's all those who rejected Jesus Christ. They are going to be raised and they're going to have to give an account before God for the things that they did. And the Bible says that everything we do is being recorded. I don't know if there's angels recorded everything we do uh, or if God has a video camera and he's following all of us around and he's going to show the video on that day I mean we have technology to do that today right God's technology is better than ours but uh, this is going to be something where they're going to have to give an account of every action every word that they spoke and even every thought that they think Jesus says they're going to be judged by their thoughts, they're going to be judged by their words, and they're going to be judged by their deeds. And unless you are perfect and you're sinless, you're going to be judged for your sins. And if your name is not written in the Lamb's book of life, if you have not trusted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, the Bible says that you're not going to be in heaven. If you reject Jesus now, he's going to reject you then. So why would you reject him now? Why, why would you not turn your life over to Christ and trust Jesus for your salvation? Today, if today you hear his voice, harden not your hearts. We know that the Bible predicted everything that's happening around our world today. We know that everything is going according to God's plan, but we also know that there's a time that's coming that's going to be the worst time in, in planet Earth's history. A great tribulation that Jesus said it's going to be the worst time that man's ever experienced. Uh, and, and he says that uh, basically if those days were not cut short, no flesh would survive it. And so uh, I uh, plead with you this morning, 
Our hope is in the resurrected Savior. I, I pray that you have trusted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Today, I'm assuming most of you have or you wouldn't be sitting in church on the Sunday morning on Easter Sunday, a Bible teaching church at that. But there may be someone here today who's never trusted Christ or perhaps you've wandered away from the faith like the prodigal son. You need to come back and I'm going to encourage you to do just that this morning. I want to read one more scripture to you and then Hunter can come back up and we're going to close with a song. In John chapter 11 and verse 25, Jesus said this incredible statement to Martha when he was about to raise her brother Lazarus from the dead. Jesus said to Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? And that's the question that I would ask you today. Do you really believe this? Do you believe that Jesus conquered death? Do you believe that there's an empty grave in Jerusalem today and that Jesus is glorified and he's alive forevermore? Do you believe that he's seated at the right hand of the throne of the Father? Do you believe that he's coming back again as we just read in the Bible? And, and if you believe this, then why do you fear? Then why are you worried about the future? We could trust that God's got the whole world in his hands and that everything is going according to his plans. Jesus is the resur resurrection and the life. And if we believe in him, we're never going to die. What he means by this is that you're never going to be consciously separated from the knowledge and the presence of God. You have the Holy Spirit dwelling within you. Uh, this is your down payment of heaven. And you will never be separated from the love of God through the love of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Let's pray. And Father, we do thank you for sending your son Jesus into this world. Thank you, Jesus, that you are willing to become a curse for us on the cross. You're willing to take our sins and die in our place. We thank you, Jesus, that you conquered death and you conquered hell. Lord, that you uh, led uh, the captives from their captivity. The Old Testament saints were delivered from Abraham's bosom and taken into heaven at that time where you were three days and three nights in the grave. Lord, you were even working then. We thank you, Jesus, that you are alive forevermore, that you are in your resurrected, glorified body, and you're just waiting for that word from the Father to come back and take your bride, your church to heaven. Lord, that we might be with you forever and ever. Bless your people today. Strengthen us today, Lord, by your word and by your spirit. Help us to live out our Christian faith, Lord God, that we would not be ashamed of the gospel, that we would confess, Lord, you before man so that you will confess us before our Father who is in heaven. Bless each one that's here today, Lord, and for any uh, who have never surrendered their life to you, they never come to Christ, Lord, I pray that today would be their birthday, Lord, their spiritual birthday, that this would be the day where they give their life to Christ, they repent of their sins, they confess Jesus as Lord, and they are born again. And we ask these things in Jesus' name, amen.